back. In this section, we're going to be talking about some challenges that might arise in social work cases um, in working with parents who are incarcerated and offer some ways that social workers and social service professionals might work with parents more effectively while they're incarcerated. One thing to think about is that, uh, of course, in order to work effectively with parents, we need to know where they are. Um, and sometimes that can be a challenge in some cases. Um, Department of Corrections does have a parent locator website, um, and that is on the resource list. You can enter the name of the parent, and you can also um, enter uh, the DOC number, if you have that available, to locate where the parent is. Uh, jails also have search engines on them to help locate individuals that are in jails. Um, information uh, for jail uh, websites is also on the resource list. In addition, there's the JVAR system that some agencies have access to to scan through jail booking systems to locate individuals who are in jails and also to find out more about their situation. As was mentioned earlier, when a parent is in a Department of Corrections facility, the CPPC can be your best friend in trying to figure out what services are available and also to communicate, use them to communicate with the parent's correctional counselor to uh, find out more about uh, how the parent is doing and in terms of uh, what services the parent is engaging in. Uh, there's also the uh, visitation coordinators in each facility, um, in addition to information in the visitation guide at the DOC website, um, and that in, you can find further information on that in the resource list. It's also important to think about the reentry process with parents who are exiting uh, jails and prisons. There are a number of resources, uh, adult mentoring programs and reentry programs that may be of assistance to help stabilize the parent as they're exiting incarceration. Now we're going to hear from Peter Kay, who will speak uh, a few minutes uh, to us about obligations of the state in providing services to parents. Thank you. The department has an obligation to offer services and visitation to parents uh, when their ch children are in state care. And those obligations extend to parents who are incarcerated. So the department is required to provide services to incarcerated parents and also visitation to those parents. But because those parents are incarcerated, that presents some unique challenges. But it also provides some unique opportunities for the department to provide those services through partner agencies such as the Department of Corrections. It's important for the department social worker to work closely with the Department of Corrections, including the parent's uh, corrections counselor, to find out what services are available in that particular institution. You can find out where a parent is, as Miriam indicated earlier, by using the jail locator services through the Department of Corrections websites. It's very helpful if you have the parent's Department of Corrections number, their DOC number, because that is how that particular inmate is classified throughout the system. On this uh, inmate locator service, you can just enter the DOC number and it will tell you exactly where that individual is. And that's quite helpful because there could be, for example, two different John Andersons incarcerated on opposite ends of the state and you want to make sure you've got the correct one. Then what you, the social worker can do is work closely with the parent's counselor in the facility to find out what services are available to craft a service plan that's appropriate, not only for the parent, but also for the department. Because given that the department has limited resources, it's not appropriate to be offering ser outside services. In fact, the department typically is not able to offer outside services to a parent that is incarcerated and instead has to work within what's available in the DOC system. But in addition to the initial offering of services, it's important for the social worker, just in working with any parent, to follow up to find out how that parent is doing. And with a parent that is incarcerated, that task is made much simpler because rather than having to maintain contact with a mental health professional, a chemical dependency professional, a parenting class instructor, the department social worker can work directly with the uh, parent's correctional counselor to find out how exactly that parent is doing in the various programs. Besides offering services, the department is also obligated to offer visitation. Now, one of the unique challenges in providing visitation to a parent that is incarcerated is that they are not free to come and go and schedule visitation according to a uh, community agency or the department's visitation schedule in the, the local visitation rooms at the department. Instead, 
the social worker has to work closely with the Department of Corrections and what their rules and policies are. So it's important in trying to develop any case plan for visitation to keep that into consideration. Now slide 45 points out that proactive case planning should be used to set a visitation schedule that can work. And that's important because the department social worker has to work carefully with DOC to craft a schedule, a plan that will work for DOC because there may be clearance issues in terms of who can come into the prison and transporting a child, uh, for example, that need to be addressed. The other thing the social worker can do is because since we know where the parent is and we know uh, essentially what the visitation hours are, we can try and establish a plan that fits that schedule in that location. For example, is there a relative that is planning on going and seeing that incarcerated parent? Maybe the social worker can work with that relative, have them do the appropriate background checks to have the child be transported by that relative to the prison on an occasional basis when that relative is going to go see uh, the parent. So in being proactive like that, the caseworker can come up with an appropriate visitation plan that works for the child, meets the child needs, and also in, uh, meets the department's obligation to provide visitation. Now it's important to take those proactive steps because if a social worker is not prepared for a particular visitation plan, the court is going to order a visitation plan. And that plan may not be appropriate for the department's resources or the issues confronting the case. So uh, those are the two main obligations of the state, services and visitation. And there are uh, partner agencies, the Department of Corrections, that can assist the department in doing their job and following through with those obligations. Thank you so much for that important information. And now uh, we're going to hear from Patrick Dowd of uh, Office of Public Defense to speak a little bit more about working effectively with parents. Well, thank you. And I think a lot of the um, elements of working effectively with parents that apply to the attorney that's representing the parent also apply to a DSHS worker or any other professional. And I think the key element is first to establish a strong professional relationship with the parent. Um, and a relationship that's built on trust. And that requires communication. Um, the first thing I think that's important is to identify, are there any uh, language or communication issues that the parent uh, has that need to be addressed? Are there language barriers? Are there literacy issues? Um, is it necessary to have a, a translator available for that communication? Um, make sure that those issues are addressed um, it requires an investment in time. And whenever possible, um, if one can meet face-to-face -face with an incarcerated parent, I think it goes a long way to establishing a, a positive relationship. Um, that's not always practical or, or possible. Um, and a lot of times professionals will rely on uh, that phone communication um, with, the, with the client. Um, it's important to be familiar with DOC policies regarding communication. Um, it's often necessary to set up the, the a scheduled call through the parent's uh, DOC counselor. Um, it's also, I think, important to identify if there are any constraints uh, that are uh, specific to an individual parent. There might be privacy concerns that that parent has while in, uh, deal, in a DOC facility. He or she may not want to receive uh, written material that would usually be provided to a parent, for example, an ISSP or a case report of some sort that contains uh, personal information. Uh, so it's in important to spend the time communicating with the client and uh, making sure you understand what his or her needs are in the course of, uh, of working with that client. Uh, for an attorney, a second uh, primary issue is demonstrating that you are their advocate. And for a DSHS worker, I think it's important to demonstrate that you are a professional, objective um, caseworker. Uh, for an attorney, as far as demonstrating advocacy, that can be a little bit more complex because the client is not sitting next to you in court 
and can uh, can see you in court uh, representing uh, their interest. Um, so it's important to do that if, if you are providing written information to uh, provide, for example, court reports, et cetera, to the client, give them the opportunity to also submit information to the court so they're feeling like they're involved um, in the advocacy as well. From a DSHS caseworker's perspective, I think it's very important to objectively and fairly portray the parent in any written material that's provided to the court. Uh, something that may seem very innocuous or insignificant to, uh, to the caseworker or, or to others may be very significant uh, to the parent. So for example, if criminal history is being set forth in a court report or an arrest record, make sure that that's a accurate because certainly the parent is going to know if that's inaccurate and they may feel that they're being treated unfairly or um, presented to the court in a biased manner. And also on that note, I think it's important to bring a strength-based approach to this type of work. So obviously parents that are involved in a dependency proceeding, there are concerns of parental deficiencies. Granted, but there's also strengths that each individual has, and I think it's important that those issues be portrayed. And certainly, as a parent's advocate, that would be uh, a core responsibility of the parent's attorney. Um, two final issues. One I've touched on briefly, which is involving the parent to the greatest extent possible. Is there a family team decision-making uh, meeting? Is there a case conference? Is there a CPT? Are there court hearings? Are, is there a staffing about to determine uh, an appropriate placement for a child? And looking at how can we include the parent's voice in this process? Granted, they can't physically be present, but we can include his or her voice. Uh, my last comment may seem very basic, but I think it's very important, and that is to provide support and encouragement. Again, a parent that's incarcerated they're isolated, they're uh, powerless over much of their own environment, um, and they cannot access the, the players within the dependency system that is making crucial decisions about their, their child um, in the same way that other parents can. So I think it's, uh, it's paramount that all of the professionals involved in the system that come in contact with the parents provide that support and that encouragement in a realistic manner. Thank you so much for that important information for social workers. Uh, one thing that's important to note as we think about reentry and services for parents as they're exiting incarceration is that having continued contact with family and with children during that time has been shown to reduce recidivism, the rearrest rate. The following are some slides that were provided uh, by Tony Johnson, a Planning Performance and Accountability Administration of DSHS, uh, the Housing and Homelessness Coordinator. And uh, I'm going to go through them and uh, just provide some background information on some housing issues facing uh, individuals who are exiting incarceration, including parents. Under current law, uh, HUD, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, has a rule that governs eligibility of criminals seeking federally assisted public housing. Um, currently, public housing authorities cannot admit families with members who are evicted from federally assisted housing for drug-related criminal activity for three years following the date of con eviction, um, who are currently engaging in illegal drug use, who have shown a pattern of illegal drug or alcohol use, um, who are subject to a lifetime registration requirement under state sex offender programs, or who have ever been convicted of manufacturing methamphetamine on public housing property. Now this is important for social workers to be aware of since housing is often a, uh, a, a huge challenge for those exiting incarceration, particularly those who are seeking to reunite with their children to ensure that they have housing available for that. Local housing authorities across the state um, have their own sets of eligibility requirements on top of the federal requirements. Um, there's 39 housing authorities in Washington state. Um, some barriers to obtaining housing can include criminal history, poor rental history, low income, not in my backyard, sensibility in terms of providing um, housing resources for ex-offenders, and uh, where there's closed waiting lists for public housing. 
There have been some shifts over time that provide some hope in uh, determining um, uh, housing resources, and hopefully this will be a, a trend across time. The King County Housing Authority um, has uh, changed its waiting period for serious crimes, including burglary, burglary um, and from 20 years to a 12-month uh, wait time. Seattle Housing Authority is also moving towards the same wait time. Now we're going to turn to Aura MacArthur uh, from Economic Services Administration. Uh, to speak with social workers for a few minutes about how to help social workers um, manage parents who have uh, high child support debt, since that can be an impediment um, who, uh, for parents who have a lot of debt uh, who are seeking employment. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. One of the reoccurring themes that we've heard today is that after someone is released is kind of the, the late time to be starting working with them on what their options are. And so one of the things, if you're working with a parent who is incarcerated or who has just been convicted and will be incarcerated, I really encourage you to talk to them about their child support obligations. Many parents believe that when they are incarcerated that their child support obligation will automatically cease or stop while they're incarcerated. And that is not the case. So if a parent is incarcerated for a year or two years or three years, their debt will continue to accrue. There are things that they can do to try to resolve that issue. They can seek a modification either through the administration or through the courts, depending on what kind of order that they have. They can look at getting some of their debt that's owed to the state forgiven. But those processes are not short. Um, they usually take at least a couple of months. And it's better to start those processes as soon as possible because they are prospective. They don't go backwards in time. So it will, it will go from the point that it's changed forward. And, and the debt that accrued up until that point will remain. One of the things that happens when an offender is released from prison is they start looking for work, they start looking at all of those resources and things that they need to do to become the kind of parent that their child deserves, as one of the parents in the panel mentioned. And one of those tasks is becoming financially solvent in a way that they can support their child or children. And child support can seem to be a very large barrier to that process they will try to find work and they'll often find that upon finding work their employer is hit with a garnishment for 50 percent of their wages and they find that they can't survive themselves let alone support a household on that on that amount of money and one of the things that we consistently encourage and, and we ask that you also encourage those parents that you work with is to communicate with the division of child support there are many options out there for parents. There are many ways that we can work with the parents, but it has to start with communication. So if the parent is frightened, a lot of times they think that if they just run and hide, child support will go away, and that is not the case. So if they reach out to us, we will do everything in our power to tell them what their options are to assist them in, in reaching those resources. Some of those resources you'll see, again, on the resource list. But you, as the, the person having contact with them, we don't often get the opportunity to talk to them face-to-face -face or even over the phone. So if um, you can share that with them and encourage them to be in communication with us, there are a lot of options out there for them. And that would be my point. And, and just, again, there's resources on the resource list on how to obtain a modification, what some of the rules are, and what kinds of debt can be forgiven and what those processes are. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we're going to move on to uh, speaking a little bit about ASFA requirements, Adoption Safe Families Act. And Carrie Kendig of Children's Administration will speak to that. Thank you. I'm talking about um, the Adoption and Safe Families Act. And what's important to remember, for social workers to remember, is the requirements laid out under that federal law do not change just because a parent is incarcerated the social worker still has an obligation to provide a reasonable efforts to reunify the child with the parent if the child is in out-of-home care. Reasonable efforts can be defined as uh, visits, offering services, um, as Mr. Kay was saying, uh, providing um, progress reports on uh, the service provision and making sure that we are offering parents um, services that are available to remedy the parental deficiencies that brought their children into foster care. It's also important for social workers to understand that we still have an obligation to reassess families uh, every six months um, through the ISSP and make those uh, reports to the court. 
Um, incarceration alone cannot be used um, as a compelling reason why not to file uh, a termination of parental rights if the child has been out of the home 12 of the last 19 months. But I think the social worker can make, uh, present a case to the court in cases where um, the, the parent might be incarcerated, but the parent is also participating in services. Progress uh, is being made regarding um, addressing the parental deficiencies. And the parent's uh, expected release date is within uh, a reasonable amount of time. And then the court is left with making the decision on whether or not um, uh, accepting a compelling reason is in the child's best interest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another thing to think about as social workers is that there are additional requirements for those cases that fall under the uh, purview of the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act, ICWA. And just a reminder for those who, who do work with ICWA cases, there's uh, great ICWA training from Children's Administration. But it is important to think creatively about what constitutes active efforts, um, which is the requirement under ICWA, um, versus reasonable efforts um, for parents who are incarcerated. And often that means going one step above. Uh, so uh, there was some conversation earlier with the parents panel about the importance of, of having that person-to-person -person communication with the social worker. That could be an example of an active effort, um, to not just send a letter, but to personally visit the um, uh, parent in prison to have that conversation and establish that communication early on. And it's very important, as, as all of us have been talking about uh, throughout this day, um, that we have active and open lines of communication, not only within DSHS and with parents and families, but also with other agencies, Department of Corrections, jail personnel, and so forth. And it's important to remember that um, if, it's, if it's on a public court order, uh, it can be shared. It's public information. Um, and uh, to, to try and, and ensure that when you have communication with DOC personnel, for example, um, that you share what's needed in terms of case coordination issues, but to be careful if there is uh, critical mental health or chemical dependency information that will be shared to ensure that you have a signed release of information that is compliant with federal HIPAA. And that concludes that section. Thank you. Mm -hmm.